Welcome everybody to using storytelling to boost your business. I think we're going to give it another minute or two here to sort of let a few, I know a few other people were planning on attending, so we'll give another minute or two. And there's one more. Hi, Becky. Welcome. Jamie, I love that picture you were using. It's gorgeous. Thank you. You're very welcome. And we have Scott and Jamie and Becky in here. All right, well, let's kick it off. So, so using storytelling to boost your business. I was about 10 feet away from Alan Alda and I'm freaking out because I've always been a huge fan of his ever since he was in MASH. And then he did the West Wing, but now more than ever before, when he has started teaching scientists how to communicate more effectively using improvisation. And so you can imagine my surprise when he's looking out to the audience and he has asked for a volunteer. And so I shoot my hand up full of enthusiasm and excitement, knowing like that first grader who knows the answer and knows that she's absolutely going to be selected by the teacher to give the response. And he and I, our eyes lock. And then he gestures to the woman right directly in front of me. I'm super happy for her, sad for me. So she walks up onto stage and he gives her this instruction. He hands her a glass of water that's half full. And he says, I'd like you to walk across the stage and then come back. Well, if Alan Alda gives you that instruction, you are definitely going to do it. So she does. And then he takes a pitcher of water and fills it to the very rim. And he gives her this directive and says, now I want you to walk across that stage, place that full glass of water on that end table and not spill a drop or your entire village will die. Well, she gives a fierce look of resilience. She's up for the task and she takes slowly a first step and the entire audience just gasps. Well, then she does another step and another. And as she's getting her cadence going, the audience starts to root for her saying, you go, you go, you've got this, you go girl. And so as she puts her, places that glass of water on that end table, the entire audience just erupts with sheer jubilation because our whole village didn't die. And as we started to simmer down, Alan Alda looked out to the audience and he says, now that's the power of a great story. It has high stakes, it's a shared experience and it connects people. And that's why all of you are here today is this idea of storytelling and how it, stories do connect us to that human experience. We get to see what's possible. So whether you're starting a brand new business or you're selling a common product or you're trying to upscale your business, the, the beauty of storytelling is that it has this persuasive ability to get people to care about what you have to say. And so if you're building relationships or partnerships, it's stories that give that wow factor. Well, good morning. I'm Tina B of Tina B LLC, which is a public speaking and storytelling business. I'm the founder and chief communicator. And so I help professionals um, achieve their effective communication style through various strategies and also engage in facilitating workshops for teams. And I'm excited to be co-facilitating this workshop for you with a dear professional friend of mine, Kathleen Kauth, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Kathleen Kauth. I'm president of K2 Beck Enterprises. I do mediation and conflict coaching. So the storytelling, uh, Tina has worked with me on how to talk about what I do because it is occasionally very, very private. It's something people don't necessarily want to share. So sometimes it's hard for me to get referrals and I have complete confidentiality. So I don't ever list who I've worked with. So for me to be able to share things without revealing details has been critical to communicating how it can actually help people. So Tina is going to use me as her, her example today and we'll teach you guys how to craft a story. 
Thank you, Kathleen. So both Kathleen and I are here to help you, whether you work for a small business or whether you are at a nonprofit or just a professional that would really like uh, to persuade others to support your business and use storytelling as the tool. So our goal is to teach you that storytelling is an effective means to boost your business. And today's example will be Kathleen's business, which is mediation. And so we're going to highlight three points. And the first that I'm going to lay out for you today is the importance of storytelling. The second is the structure of storytelling to give you that help. And then finally, you're going to get the opportunity to develop and practice your story. So everybody needs to be taking notes because yes. I'm going to ask you to, um, as we go through this, write down these things so that you can share with us. We, we will have a volunteer or we'll pick a volunteer. So <laughs> that's right. And on top of that, as questions start to arise, which they may as we're presenting, please write those in the chat because we want to definitely address those. And whether we address it at that moment or towards the end, we will allow some time for Q&A to help you out with, with any thoughts, questions, concerns that you may have. So I'm my sophomore year of college, I found myself running to the mailbox frequently waiting for this big manila envelope because you know if you get a big manila envelope and not the small envelope that the small one means rejection and the big one means you've been accepted and so when that big one arrives in the spring of 1995 and it has the logo of Walt Disney World on it I'm so excited for I've been accepted into the Walt Disney World program as a cast member for the 25th anniversary to coordinate parades in the Magic Kingdom. So I'm in and I can help make the magic happen. And so I get there and during that time the first several weeks it's very intense traditions training where as a cast member you get to hear this, this rich story of how Walt came up with this vision of creating a beautiful imaginary space full of creativity for family to have fun. And then you hear testimonials of guests that come to the park and see these great pictures of young ladies dressed up as princesses and hugging Cinderella. And you also hear more testimonials and stories of cast members and how they really truly connected with the Disney experience. And so I bought in and I really found that this mission of remembering the magic and the storytelling piece really aligned well together. So fast forward four weeks later, and I'm in the Magic Kingdom, specifically Frontierland. It's moments before the three o'clock parade. And I see this family of seven people. They're disheveled. They look frustrated, exhausted, all things, particularly if it's a warm, humid day in Florida. And they come right up to me and the mom just huffs and says, well, we're never coming back to Disney. And as I as a cast member, that is something you do not want someone, a guest to say and then leave. And so I put on my guest services recovery hat and I asked her, I said, well, what's wrong? Please share your story. And so with empathy, I listened to how all, th all the things went wrong. You know, a ride went down, she couldn't, get, her ATM card wasn't working, they got lost, all these things. So after listening, I swooped them into Main Street's Emporium and got each of the kiddos a t-shirt. Then they all got ice cream cones. Who doesn't love a good ice cream cone? And then got them on Splash Mountain without having to wait for a ride. After all of this, had the conversation with the mother and she's like, wow, you spent an hour and a half of your time with us. Like nobody's ever done that before. This was wonderful and magical. And I guess we will be coming back. And I said, of course, that's what we do here at Disney. And it was in that moment that I realized that I found that that training and that intensity in which Disney really highlighted the importance of story and aligned story with their mission to remember the magic and make the magic happen really was embodied in me as their cast member working for them. So I know all of you have worked with other organizations or have had experiences. And why don't you put in the chat some examples of organizations that have strong stories, you know, whether it's a, you know, a positive story or one that is memorable, one that you've heard of. Um, Kathleen, can you think of an organization off the top of your head that has a strong story? Um. I, I see know. Zappo. Yes, that's and a good hey, example. Tom Shoes is one. Yes, that, you know that, Tom that Shoes doing something good for someone. They tied that in so tightly with their marketing. Um, that's what you think of, not the shoes. Absolutely. 
And I know that there, there'll be others that probably pop up as we get to thinking here. And so, um, oh yes, AAA of Nebraska, 18 years of service taking care of members. That's really great, absolutely. So before we dive into the five beats of story, I want you to get a sheet of paper in front of you uh, so that you can start to really brainstorm and walk away with something that's helpful and useful for you and what you do in your business. And before we lay out those five steps or beats rather, I want you to think and write down the answers to these three questions because you need context before you lay out the beats of a story. And the first question I want you to ask yourself is what are you trying to accomplish with this story? So it's, it's thinking to the end game first. So you wanna start at the end and work your way back. So are you trying to pitch an idea? Are you trying to suggest a change in the company? Are you trying to win an account, get a new client, fund a project that you're excited about? What is that accomplishment you're trying to get? So jot that down first. Number two, who's your audience? So to whom are you speaking? Is it one person where you're trying to land that one client? Is it a series of professional entrepreneurs that you want to fund a project or donate to your cause? Is it internally your boss and a department that you want to change an idea within the company? All that matters. So what do they need to know? And what do they want to know? So note that audience. And then the last piece before we start working through storytelling structure is, you know, who's your audience? You know, it's thinking about who's that audience? Is it, and who's that point of view, excuse me. So is it your story? Is it the story of your client or a testimonial? So you have the, what do you wanna accomplish first? Who's your audience? And finally, what's that point of view? That you, that you are trying to tell the story through. So with my Disney story, that was my point of view. Um, so before we, but I want you to, first of all, think about when you hear the word storyteller, would you identify as one? How many, I see some yes or no's. A lot of people say, absolutely not. I'm not a storyteller. And maybe even go so far as to say, what stories do I even have to share? I don't know anything. I can't share a story. And so I think of my son at four years old who absolutely loves a good joke and he started to really tap into puns and loved a good pun. And so when he was playing with knock-knock jokes with a friend of mine and putting the, the punchline at the beginning and the middle and all these different places, she, she said to him, you know, that's not your best work, buddy. And he took that to heart. So he got a joke book, he started practicing. And then there was that first moment that he realized when he put the punchline at the end and he got an authentic hearty laugh from his dad and me, he just glowed because he realized and recognized he just needed to learn the structure. And that's like you, all of you are naturally born orators of your own lives and narrators. You all have stories. You all can share them. It's just getting that help of, of practice and structure. So do you have in front of you your paper in which you have written down those responses of what you want to accomplish, who's your audience, and what's your point of view? So Kathleen's been so kind um, to work with me with her business as an example. And, you know, she could decide to talk about the origin of her business. She could decide to do a testimonial, maybe a quest story or, you know, whatever that is. But Kathleen, so what are you trying to accomplish with your story today? What's your end game, end goal with the story that we're going to talk through a little bit today with the group? So I actually have two different types of mediation that I do. I do organizational mediation, working with businesses, helping untangle conflicts, team dysfunctions. I work with CEOs on conflict uh, resolution and direct communication. That, that kind of is, is exciting and, and feeds my business. The part that feeds my soul is working with elder care um, mediation. So that is working with older adults and their families as they have to make some extraordinarily difficult decisions and often with not much time to make those decisions with many, many emotional complicating factors. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So one of my problems is specifically when dealing with older adults in their late seventies and eighties, they do not wanna talk about their private personal business. There's, there's nothing that they wanna share with an outsider. And when right. you're dealing with the adult children, of, of older adults um, who are in crisis, 
they very often revert to their worst 12 year old self and become extremely difficult to communicate with. So what I needed to do is be able to communicate how elder care mediation can actually work to build a structure of communication within families so that after the older adult is gone, the family can still you know, move on successfully. So I use um, one of my, my most favorite um, clients ever. I was contacted by a woman and again, I keep everything- So before you dive into the story, what are you trying to accomplish? I'm trying to accomplish a connection with people so that they understand when they, I mean, when you hear talking about your conflicts or, you know, that's very private and personal. And it's often to people who are so entrenched in conflict that they can't see a way out. So I'm trying to offer them a story that will illustrate how bad somebody else had it at one time and how they worked their way out of it and now how good things are for them. So you can um, use it with a current client or to land a new client, right? right? To accomplish that. And what would you, and so that would be your audience would either be a current client to sort of help them through it or land a new client. Right. So it's either accommodate, you know, support, providing support or trying to get a new client. That would be what you're trying to accomplish. Right. And so then from that audience, what it's, whose point of view will you be telling the story from your point of view or your client's point of view? I will be telling it from my client's point of view. One of the parts of mediation is the mediator is not a part of it. The mediator is guarding the process, but does not insert themselves into the story. So while it definitely affects me emotionally, it's about their story and how they work together. So I'm telling it from their perspective. Excellent. So with that, let's dive in. Does everybody have maybe an idea running, running through their mind just a little bit in alignment to what their business or what might work for them? I hope so as we walk through this. So this is the storytelling structure. It's laying it out in five beats. And so the first of the five beats is the setup. And this is providing background information to your story so that the listener knows the context. So think of The Wizard of Oz. I'm sure many of you have seen that movie. It's an old classic. So the setup for that particular movie is that Dorothy is the main character. She is living with her aunt and uncle on a farm in Kansas with her dog Toto. And she is looking out the window and just dreaming that there's got to be something more than just where she's at in her life on this farm in Kansas. And so it's sort of letting us know if you are telling the story and it's from your perspective, it's you, the protagonist saying, where are you? So it usually stories are there in the past. So let us know where you are in your life. Are you in college? Are you currently in your first year of employment? You know, whatever that experience was, what were you feeling, thinking in that moment? So Kathleen, for this particular story, what's the setup? The setup is I was contacted by a woman in her 60s um, who is a primary caregiver for her mother who is in her late 80s. Um, mom has dementia, uh, has Alzheimer's that is progressing. And the sisters who lived out of town were becoming incredibly critical, according to my, my soon-to-be client, about how the care was being given. And very often that happens that people who don't see what's going on have lots of opinions and the person who is there doing the real work really resent that. Um, they had a very, very bad argument over Christmas and had not spoken to each other since. And that had been in March, so three months. And so this was just an initial conversation talking about it. She wanted to find out what mediation was and um, talk with her sisters, at least try to bring up the subject of maybe we need someone to help us talk. Excellent. So it's giving the background of not only the characters of the story, their relationship with each other and where they're at, you know, emotionally thinking, feeling those kinds of things, because the more that you can bring in those sensory details, those emotions and lay out the primary character or characters, in this case, it's client become clients for Kathleen, the more you're getting your audience in the know, they need to be aware. And it's sort of with my Disney story, I started with I, you know, my back, my background was that whole uh, being in college and waiting for that envelope to find out if I, if I got the job. So good. That's the first beat is the setup. You got to set the context for your audience. The second beat of the five beats is the inciting incident. So this is the experience that, de that, the, that demands action. It's internal or external conflict. It can be both. So for example, 
if we think back to the Wizard of Oz, there was a moment where it demanded action. And that's when the house landed on the Wicked Witch of the East. And so what happens? You know, so something has to happen, right? And that's an external conflict where you can see it. So in 2019, businesses here in Mills County and Southwest Iowa were affected and impacted by the floods and some closed, some were really structurally had damage. That would be an external conflict example. If, however, maybe you have a family business, a mom and pop's grocery store, and maybe you know grandma, grandpa and grandma were running it, and suddenly there's a sudden death, that affects and influences that. That would be, uh, you know, and then you have to decide what you're going to do if you're going to be part of it. That internal decision making, um, the death would be kind of external, but then you have to make that decision: Do I go to grad school? Do I take over this business? That's an internal conflict, and you could have both, right? So. Kathleen, what about this particular client's story? What would you say was the inciting incident? The inciting incident was COVID. So they had not spoken really to each other since Christmas. In March, she decided to contact me and find out about it. And then pretty much the entire world shut down. And her panic level went through the roof because now all of a sudden, you know, there could be this, this disease that kills mom. And how does she take care of her better? What if she brings something into the house? will her sisters blame her for her mom's death forever? I mean, it was just her stress was so high and the sisters was as well, because when she reached out to them, they agreed to do a mediation and the mediation had to be put off because the sisters lived in Wisconsin and had travel restrictions and couldn't leave the state. So we were in a waiting phase, which just increased the tension dramatically for everyone. The conflict was absolutely palpable. Excellent. Well, you hit on a couple of moments there that required action. So you have this international pandemic, which is a stressor and external conflict, but then you also have an ailing parent and the decision making is needing to happen. And then there's internal conflict within the, the family unit and the fact that they hadn't communicated for a while. So there's these layers of a couple of things, you know, the, the pandemic as well as ailing parent requires an action. And so that leads us to the third of the five beats, which is the rising action. And it obviously, you know, one thing that you have to note with storytelling is you want to balance clarity with curiosity. Your audience wants to know, they want to be in the know, but they don't want to know completely at the very beginning. So they want to know two plus two, but don't give them four right away. You need to build on that with layers. And so the rising action, the because of that is, so what did, in the case of Wizard of Oz, what did Dorothy do, you know, because the, the house landed on the Wicked Witch of the East, she meets not one, not two, but three crucial characters, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion. And they all decide as a unit together that they're going to go off to see the wizard. And so it's the because of that, that the next movement happens in the story. So what was the rising action, Kathleen, for this client? Um, they, they agreed to a mediation. And again, because so many offices had shut down and because usually with elder care mediation, we will do mediation with the older adult present in their home so that they're comfortable, they're able to participate. Because of COVID, this was not possible. Um, so I turned my dining room into a mediation center and um, worked out great. My husband is terrified. I'm going to paint whiteboard paint all over the walls. Um, but they came to my house in April um, for that mediation. Excellent. So because of that, they made the commitment that, you know what, we need to do something. And the something that we need to do is we need to communicate with each other. We can't do it on our own. We're all stressed. We're in a really high stressful time. And Kathleen, as a mediator, can help us, you know, better understand what to do next. And so bring in someone. So that's the because of that. So that leads us to the fourth beat. After the rising action, you have the climax and the resolution. Now, in eighth grade, maybe earlier when you were learning in literature class, these were separated. I like to bundle them together because it's very quick. The climax is super quick and then boom, something gets resolved. So it's what happens as a result of the rising action. It's the highest point of your story. And then how does it get resolved? So in the case of The Wizard of Oz, you know, what happens when those four characters enter the land of Oz and they meet the great and powerful Oz? Well, they find it's just a dude behind a curtain. So 
he wasn't really this great, powerful Oz at all. So what about you, Kathleen, in terms of crafting what, what became the, the climax or resolution for your story with this client? So once, once they had sit down, sat down to the mediation and we got started with the process, um, we very quickly got to the point where they spoke directly to each other about um, the two sisters' expectations and the one sister's concerns. And they were completely the opposite of what they thought. The two sisters' concern was their one sister not their mom. Hmm. So they started talking and they started understanding what the concerns were of the one sister who was home taking care of their mom. Basically they said, mom is, you know, she is in her, I think she was 82 and she has Alzheimer's and she's lived a brilliantly wonderful life. We care about you. Beautiful. And so from there on every issue that they had, once we untangled that, every issue that we had about care, um, hospitalization, DNIs, uh, pain, the one sister who was accepting nothing, had been taking care of the mom for five years and was accepting no payment. And the other two sisters were like, you need to get money. You need to be accepting payment. She didn't want to do that because she thought it was wrong. So, so they worked out every one of these details and it was so fast. I'm like, okay, well, you guys are, <laughs> we are just bundling through this. But again, they removed that big emotional rock and misunderstanding that they had. And once they understood where each other was coming from, their, their solutions just untangled themselves. Right, so in this story, it's crucial to note that the misunderstanding was the trickle down effect of all the negative energy and why they weren't getting along, that there was misunderstanding in terms of what one thought, the other thought really didn't think, you know, all those things. And so that's where it was the aha moment of truly, tapping into open-ended communication that your mediation business was able to provide, that you opened up those doors, asked those thoughtful questions that were open-ended to get the conversation and the dialogue to create that, to have co-created message making so that they can move forward. So this is the last beat. So that was beat four. The last beat is probably the most powerful and really important that you should not forget that many people do, just like in public speaking, a lot of people just end with, do you have any questions? They really don't wrap up their presentation, but it's the fifth beat, it's the transformation. How did the actions and resolution change the storyteller? So if you're the protagonist of your story, how you start in the experience as one person and you evolve to someone else. And it changes you, right? And so it, in this case with Kathleen, it'll be a client, but for the Wizard of Oz, I think of Dorothy, right? She recognizes and realizes in that moment that she didn't need to go seek the powerful, you know, great Oz, that it was within her all along. And so no place like home, she goes back to home because she knew it was within herself. She didn't need someone else to make things better for her. So transformation point what what about that beat for your client Kathleen once they once they started actually talking and and understanding each other um, they reverted back to the way they were when they were kids they actually were car I'm going to use a, a fake name Smith they were called the Smith girls like people in town knew them as a unit because they were so close and so by the time they left we had a lot of chocolate. So by the time we left uh, my place, um, there were plans for going to their favorite restaurant here in town, having margaritas, talking through old times, spending time with their mom. I mean, they, they were planning future oriented things um, that had nothing to do with the conflict whatsoever. And it was as if they had completely reverted back to their natural cohesive sisterhood, um, which was, Great. it was so cool. Well, and it's great that mediation got them there. So the transformation for your client is that they started out in the story frazzled, frustrated, stressed, concerned, scared, fearful, so many things, the unknown, so much uncertainty. And then they left, you know, in a better space with clarity of what people were thinking, feeling um, with potential for moving forward together as a family unit. And so that emotional journey, I think, is really huge and important to captivate within the story. So now it's actually your turn. We would love to have one of you volunteer uh, to start off and to get the opportunity to practice, to kind of share 
a story. And, and I'll give one quick one to kind of walk through a different example to kind of give you a little bit more think time because I know that it's putting you on the spot, but it's giving you some free help to move forward with your story. So I think of a friend of mine that she, this is her story and it's about Southwest Airlines, another really strong company that has a definite story and, and strong company culture. And she, the, the setup or the background information would be that she is you know, working for a company, had been there for almost 13 years, heavily travels every, every week, travels Southwest Airlines and goes to the same location all the time. And does that return flight Thursday to Friday, Thursday to Friday. So she had that routine and love traveling, appreciates, you know, has made connections, not just, you know, there in that city she was traveling to, but also on through the airline. So the inciting incident was she had her wallet stolen on the day in which she was supposed to fly. The rising action, what, what did she do? How did she react to that? Well, the first is a call to mom, some blubbering, I lost my wallet. Then it's calling the airline in which then they, because of that, bring her, ask her to come to the airport to help solve the issue. And the fourth B with a climax and resolution is how did Southwest Airlines resolve that this issue and react to this particular customer? Well, they not only gave her an in and said, you know what, the next flight is in a couple hours. You can get on that flight. We recognize you, you've been a great customer. So without, you know, we see that you were, you had, purchased a ticket, we'll just get you on this flight. And then they gave her $50 knowing she had no money, she needed lunch. And then later that night, they call her to see, did she make it home safely? How are you doing? And so that leads to the transformation, right? If she's telling the story, she not only is a huge Southwest Iowa Airlines customer, but she now is promoting them because of their exemplary customer service. So again, that's an experience that when you hear it, you think, wow, you know, if I'm a frequent flyer, it'd be hard not to pick Southwest Airlines. So anybody willing to be a volunteer to kind of talk through, and again, this is a rough draft. There's no such thing as the perfect story. I still tweak stories constantly, ones that I've practiced and performed and presented frequently. So this is just to get started. Remember, if no one volunteers, I get to pick. And Kathleen likes that. <laughs> I do. Dusty, would you like to go? I knew you were going to call on me. So I knew she was too. <laughs> so I was like, do I just volunteer or just wait for, you know, but you had a quick countdown. So I, um, there's two ways I could go with this. There's, you know, because I know that we, you guys follow me on LinkedIn and stuff and I've kind of changed my LinkedIn game to, you know, my three pillars approach. And then I obviously am a financial advisor. So the, the story that I kind of want to, I'm going to go with the second piece, the financial advising piece. And the, the background in information is we're all curious about like, do we have enough to retire when we want to retire? And the story is I at 34, I was like, man, I don't think I can retire because I have no retirement savings. So that that's kind of where I would start the story of that. We all have had that moment of, I don't think I can, but I don't know if I can. So that that's kind of where I would start it. No, that's a great start. So even just opening up with I'm 34 and I have $0 in my savings account, right? That would be a great hook. And then lead into, you know, what kind of job you're doing, where, where you're at, if you're a father, you know, kind of give us some of a little bit of that background information, that setup. And what are you trying to accomplish, Dusty, with this particular story? Are you trying to land a client? Uh, are you trying to pitch an idea? You know, what what is it you're trying to accomplish with this particular story? Because I think that's a good opener uh, yeah. to set it up. Well, I, I think that um, what we're creating here is one of my next videos. Um, and okay. So <laughs> That, that's why I was like, she's going to call me anyway, so we might as well go with it. Um, so what I'm trying to accomplish is just the, yeah, land, land more clients, land a new client. So identifying with, like I said, that um, we've all been there. And for those of us that haven't figured it out, that it's okay. And, and then that inciting incident would be, that's where I'm trying to think of like the internal conflict of the not knowing Right. You know, if I can provide for my family or provide for, not even for my family, can I provide for myself and my spouse 
when we turn 65. Right um, now, so for your inciting incident, can you specifically pinpoint a moment in time because you wanna make the abstract concrete. Yes. So for example, um, you know, if it's going for me, the moment of getting that, um, you know, drum roll of finding the, the envelope and then that, that was part of my setup, but then it was hearing this woman go, I'm never going to Disney World again. You know, it was a moment of, oh dear, I'm in this organization. I believe in their story. I need to embody that story. So what's a moment in time where you in the drive-through and you didn't have enough money to pay for burgers for the family? Like, can you think of a something very specific that aligns with the, oh crud, not only do I not have savings, but I'm starting to feel that financial stress to give, you know, to, to get, to require you action. Yeah, no, it was, it was the moment of um, realizing that I had no retirement account. So, okay. So then that would be your inciting incident instead of your hook, maybe. So you would probably start off with something like giving background information. You know, I'm working as a blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I'm a father of two, wife, blah, 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 blah. Then the inciting incident is, so I'm, I'm searching online, I'm going into my bank account and I recognize and look at it, this blaring zero on the screen. Yes. And I, so, so that's your inciting incident, I would say. Yeah. And so yeah. you'll want to think of a good strong hook to kind of um, hook that audience to build to that. Because I think as seeing a zero and go, I am 34 and I have zero retirement, then that requires, what's your rising action? Um, I changed careers. <laughs> okay. That's huge. So then because of that, I changed careers. I went from this to this. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, that, that was um, how I do everything is I go, okay, well, I have this problem and I need to fix it. I need to figure it out. And, and part of that too, was then changing careers. Um, and so then that's where it really leads to, because the whole story is now I, in, in my job, I, I call it the green check mark. That was the kind of the story I was thinking about. And the green check mark is you were on track to right. retire. And, and so that's where I'm kind of jumping ahead because the climax and the transformation is after two and a half years, I now have a check mark. You know, that's so now, huge, right? It's, so you it's, start absolutely. out as one guy and you transform into another. Yes. So yeah, yeah, so that that's kind of the story is that it is possible even if you don't think you're on track. So right. Like so I think that that's great, and I also think too. So the highest action, the climax of the story, is you know. Be, so the because of that is I decide you know okay the career I'm in right now is not doing it for me. I need to change jobs because of that. I have conversations you know with my wife, and you know we we make a budgeting plan or whatever that is. So have at least two to three rising actions that you're working through. And then you get to the climax and that highest point, you know, when is it you realize that um, you're gonna be okay? Is it after that first paycheck of the new job? Um, you know, whatever that is. And yeah. then you transform into, okay, I started out as the guy that was not gonna provide for my family. I was the guy that blah, 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 but now, I am, I feel at peace. I know that I can do this and that I am not alone and you're not alone. And it just takes a, a shift of mindset and, you know, a budget and a plan and, and following through with that plan. I like it. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for being voluntold, Dusty. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Like I said, my, the, the cursor was hovering over the mute button as she started to count down. Uh, I you like, can see it. Usually, la, 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 la. Oh, I, I love well, it. I know and, both and of you. The reason Dusty got picked is he's literally the first person I ever did a Zoom call with from LinkedIn, and he tells some of the best jokes. So, you know, if you tell good jokes to me, good jokes meaning ones that are so bad that my 17-year-old goes, please stop, then you're Yes, in. absolutely. Well, so as we're getting, <laughs> as we practice, are there any other participants here that have a question about their story before we move on to our last point? We will have time for questions at the end, but- you know, Jamie or Scott, do either of you have questions or Dusty, do you have an additional question? No, I think that this is awesome. And, and that's why I wanted to jump on this one. And, and just everything that we do is storytelling. Absolutely. And, and I think if you can also think in terms of this is where you get to play with your story, where can you put in the sensory details? You know, like, what were you wearing? What do you remember? 
you know, what was in your visual, give us that, those word pictures of the sights, the smells, the taste, touch, all of that. And then the emotional details, right? Of what were you, tell your internal dialogue. Like if you're able to say, so I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I am a poor role model for my five-year-old that this is not okay, right? It, you know, share those internal musings to show that transformation because the, we can't, as audience members, we don't know what you're thinking or feeling unless you say it out loud. And that's the beauty of being the protagonist of your own story is that you get to share those emotions. And the more that you struggle, because audiences appreciate a good struggle, the more we care for you, the more that we say, I've been there in some capacity. It may not be financially, it may be something else, but I've been on that journey and we want to take that journey with you. And so if you're willing to say the journey out loud of the struggle of the emotions, then it makes the greatest impact. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. So um, we'll go, we'll move on to our second point. Welcome Elvira. Oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going for who volunteers. I was. Oh, gonna, yeah. I saw a hand raised. I'm like, Come no, on. this goes to question too. Well. Okay, good. A question before we move on. So, Absolutely. So um, I'm one of those people who doesn't naturally see themselves as a storyteller. Uh, so I really like how you're breaking like these five beats down and thinking about structure. So in my head, what I'm wondering is, does a story always have conflict? And I like that you broke it down. It could be an internal and or external, but is there always conflict or, because sometimes I think of a story as more of like a lesson or something like that, but Absolutely. maybe there's always conflict and I haven't broken it down to think about it. No, that's a great question, Elvira. So I'll start and then I'll let Kat Kathleen uh, build from there. But I think in order for a story to be interesting, you have to have some form of conflict. Now the word conflict is a really, you know, it can get a bad, good, bad, a bad reputation and Kathleen can probably agree with that. Uh, but we don't enjoy stories or find them interesting or intriguing if the guy and the gal get married, they have the children, they live in a big house and they live happily ever after. There needs to be a little bump in the road. And so you may not label it conflict, uh, you label it you know, s some sort of challenge. Uh, something that they have to discover about themselves or learn about themselves, because that's the beauty of story is that as characters, you know, walking through this thing we call life, we have bumps in the road and they don't have to be stories like climbing Mount Everest, which that would be a huge feat in and of itself, but it can be small, uh, where even getting lost in a parking lot, not a big deal, but still requires something that you learn about yourself. Maybe it's the kindness of a stranger um, that, that comes out of that. So great question. Uh, Kathleen, I know as the conflict expert, I'd love to hear your take on this. So, and, and that's exactly right, Tina. Um, conflict is, people have such a negative connotation of it. Conflict just means that friction point where there's one thought or, and another thought, and they're going to have to figure out, okay, which way do we go with it? Or there's one um, action and another action and, you know, which path do you take? It doesn't have to be the knockdown drag out. You know, the, the people in my um, story were having a huge emotional conflict, um, but it was a very quiet one. So, I mean, it was, it was something no one else would possibly even see as a conflict because they couldn't see it. So when you, when you worry about it being a conflict, it's not even necessarily an external, but it's that internal. If it just makes you uncomfortable telling stories, that's a conflict. That's the internal conflict. So that's the hook right there is I hate doing this with a passion and, you know, talk about that. That is your conflict. That's your point that, that people are like, oh yeah, I feel that way too. Or wow, I find it easy. Let me hear more about her and why it's so tough for her. So, well, and yeah, and Elvira working for yourself, I think that Kathleen has a point there. If you're going to share an origin story, if you're working for yourself, that you've recognized that in order to get the word out there, the challenge is, okay, I have to get my story. I have to do videos and there are challenges that come with it. And it's that internal thinking, that intrapersonal communication of what are you saying to yourself to that, that can cause some struggle of just, oh, I got to do this thing. And it's, it's hard. And to me, that's the internal conflict that you could share it and that people working for themselves could very much like me included could empathize with. 
So we'll move on. Uh, thank you so much for that question, Elvira. Can we'll move on to the last point. We've talked about the importance of storytelling. We've laid out the five beats for stories. Now it's how do you go about you know, actually collecting? You have developed or started a story. How do you share that story? And so Kathleen's gonna lay out a couple ideas of what she's been doing in her mediation business. So one of the things I do, um, you know, for organizational, I will send out a survey to everybody who participated in um, a team dysfunction, um, mediation, whatever it is, and I'll ask them for feedback. Number one, so I improve myself and so I can help highlight, okay, either they got it or they didn't and I can follow up with them. The other thing that I has been a struggle for me is asking clients for a referral or a testimonial um, because again, I am very, very... Um, big on confidentiality. So for me to ask someone to, again, these are very emotional things that are happening for them to choose to do it. And I always let them know, you know, there's, there's no obligation whatsoever when they choose to do it. It is genuinely from the heart. And so this is the um, testimonial I got from that client. And what's great is showing the actual snapshot of it is a lot more authentic than just typing it out and getting their permission. So in addition to that, you can use stories and collect stories for, and post them on YouTube on a channel that you have or any social media, whether it's a video on Facebook or an interview live on Facebook or on LinkedIn or even pictures on Instagram and, and you know pictures worth a thousand words with a little statement, your website face-to-face as well as in conversations with people and in thank you notes too, you know, noting what has happened. You know, so the key is, is when you think about collecting your stories, it's getting the practice. It's starting to get out of your head about it and labeling yourself as a storyteller for your business, because the more you do that, the more you get confident and competent with it. So practice sharing your story with friends, with family, get it out there because the more you tell about your business struggle or the more that you tell you overcame it and what you've learned or what you have done for a client, the more people will care about you and care about your business. The second piece is be consistent. So if you work for a nonprofit and you have a team Make sure that all of you, like with my experience with Disney and other organizations as well, that the message and the story aligns with the core values as well as the mission. And so I think about my time at Omaha Stakes as a human resources recruiter, and we were literally part of the training. It didn't matter if you were in sales, HR, marketing, whatever, you got training on the product because they wanted you to have that product knowledge. So you sampled all the meats in terms of a filet mignon and, and, and a New York strip and a ribeye and top sirloin. And then they gave you descriptors of robust beefy flavor and heavy marbling. And, and so that you could say, I know the difference between the filet mignon and the top sirloin. And so that's what's important is getting everybody on page with the story that it's consistent and you get that practice. So today we focused in on the importance of storytelling, the structure of story, and gave you an opportunity to not only develop and get started on your story, practice it and, and determine where or how could I start sharing those stories. You know, our purpose was really to help you understand that storytelling has persuasive power. Like Dusty had noted earlier, everything he does is about storytelling, you know, that it's, it's about you being the protagonist in your own stories and, and sharing those experiences and bringing people together. Now, this particular Lunch and Learn uh, is part of my origin business story. You know, Kathleen can attest to this. We have had conversations for probably seven plus years about me dipping my toe into starting my own business and then dipping it back out because of fear of failure, fear of finances. You know, I wasn't just quite ready to start my own business and just put myself out there, you know, it, just being seen and would I make connections and help people. But it took an international pandemic and, and changed all of that. I was quiet with myself and actually said, okay, what makes my heart sing? Let's just jump out of the plane figuratively and, and see what, what happens and, and how I land on my feet. So I challenge all of you here today to tell more stories you know, to, to use storytelling in your business, because not only will it make more connections, it will grow your business and it will change people because stories transform us and they transform your audience. You know, so let the story do the work. You are all storytellers for your story 
matters. So what questions do you have for me? I, I, I know that we have, we have about a few minutes here at the end. I would love to answer additional questions, have a conversation dialogue to help people. Um, and, and before we do that, I do wanna offer for anybody here on this call, you know, I, I'm open to a discovery call. If you'd like more information, check out tinabaycast.com. It's in the chat. It's uh, also got, here has Kathleen. I also have LinkedIn. You can email me questions. I'm here to help. Also have a, a free workbook on my website if you click on that and, and get some help with message making. And we have an upcoming Lunch and Learn February 24th also on communication and temperament and how do you make the you know communication style, how does that affect and empower how you know yourself, your client and your team. So question, oh, Kathleen, and she has an offer also. Oh, just I'm, I'll am i talk to anybody anytime if you need to um, do a, a call to see if you need mediation or if you have some conflict questions that you want to run by me, let me know. Um, and I think Becky had a question. Yes, I, I did. I, I, I want to circle, answer that. I want to circle back to the beginning and your story about the woman carrying the glass and uh, the fact that the story had a vested interest for everybody in the audience, not just the person who is called on to Absolutely. do the activity. So as you build your story, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking of it, I come from uh, the Greater Omaha Chamber. My primary role is to bring on board new members, but also to help existing members maximize their um, membership uh, to get the most out of their dues and to really help make connections. And in doing so, I'm thinking not a story about me, but a story about one of my members who also happens to be a longtime friend of mine who has a yoga studio and in the midst of the pandemic, certainly had to pivot hard right in order to you know stay in business and keep above above water so to speak even though she was nearly close to paying off the banknote on on her business mm -hmm. um, when the pandemic struck so how what tips do you have to bring that story around so that the person that you're speaking with feels a part of and feels some kind of connection to it as opposed to, to just being a story about somebody else, whether it's a story about me or a story about somebody I know. How, right. how I appreciate you giving that context. Out. So, you know, for example, your friend who has the yoga studio um, and is a current uh, chamber member, I think first of all, what's helpful is to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with that individual and, and say, to, to validate that they have something we're sharing. You know, I think sometimes it's getting out of our heads about we aren't storytellers. So I think having that one on one, it's not threatening. It's not in front of people. It's saying, you know, I just appreciate you. I appreciate your story and 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 listen and let them tell it again. Right. And, and say, you know, after they've shared that story, then make an ask and say, would you mind being would you mind sharing your story as a testimonial for the chamber, you know, via video or whatever medium that you want to use, or it's maybe through an interview, you know, whatever style that you feel like is comfortable for you, Becky, or for the chamber, but there's different angles in which to help your people feel comfortable, to feel like it's a partnership and to hear not only the pain point of this woman and how she truly had to pivot her business and, and you know you couldn't have classes face to face the way you normally did and maybe go back go onto instructional videos online i'm making this up i don't know for sure but share that because she, she's not alone she's right. not alone not only from a standpoint of in her world of healthcare and education but also from a small business standpoint of of feeling that angst and so i think it's first affirming her and saying, you know, we appreciate you. We're glad you're a chamber member, you know, would, and, and just give the ask, because I think a lot of times organizations don't ask, they don't ask enough to say, would you mind doing a testimonial? You know, it's nerve wracking because we don't like rejection, but it can be empowering too. And maybe it's even saying, you know, the more you get your story out there, the more people are more willing to support you because they know, they'll know you, you'll be part of the chamber circuit. So there's also a win-win. It's helping the chamber partnership, like with saying, hey, here's a case study of somebody that we have helped and supported and that they've worked through this and you could be like them, but then they are also getting that recognition that they desperately need in times of crazy, you know, where they get seen more. 
And it's also getting out of the fear because I went through this too during the pandemic of just not wanting to get on video camera. It was exhausting. And, and I recognized I had to get through that little bit of fear of, okay, figure out the technology. And I don't love being seen. It feels very like, okay, I'm talking to a camera. I don't feel the energy of the people, but it's working through that as well. So I hope that answers your question. I don't know if Kathleen has something to add to that. I think that's a great question. Well, I think um, also asking someone for their story validates their story um, and flatters them. And like, that's something worthy of sharing. And so, you know, Elvira thinks that she has no stories. I bet I could spend 10 minutes with Elvira and find 20 different stories that she could tell. So, so you, I have stories. So I just don't, feel you just don't like sharing. You don't think there's conflict in your story, right? <laughs> uh, I just never there's thought about it, but yeah. now yeah. I'll, I will. Yeah. Yeah. And then I like the description of the, I could do this or that. And that being that friction and that being the conflict mm -hmm. because yes, yeah. this or, and, and, and this or that is, is a decision-making, right? We, we want to know what is yeah. that decision going to be because it's sort of like sliding doors. Remember if you've seen that movie in a split second, the stories were completely different and it was a, this or that moment. Like, do I make the train and get on or do I miss it? And then it becomes a totally different story. Any other questions? These are great. I guess I'm kind of struggling with how much detail to put in because I have several threads that come together to relate to my current job. Um, and I don't know how much detail to go into about my background on all of those different threads. So it makes sense to people. Right, that's a great question in terms of context and knowing the amount of information. So these five beats, this, this could be a long five plus minute story, but sometimes you're in a sound bite of a minute, right? So you got to flush it out quickly. So for example, uh, it's going from the, I'm going to give the spiel about what I do and how I help people to, I protect audiences from boring speeches, you know, one liner, right? Um, so it's thinking about, you know, the first piece is, is what, what's your advocacy statement for you and your business, your six to eight words of who you are, what you do, what you believe in the why, right? Sort of that bumper sticker piece. Start there. That's your spiel for like the 15 second or less. It's a one sensor and then say, okay, great. I have 30 seconds now. What can I layer on there? So if you can start, the hardest is always the shortest. You know, you either start at the hardest and work your way to the biggest, right? Some people work that way or start really with that long story first. Start with writing it all out and say, okay, this is my business origin story. I'm going to, you know, give full swelling five to seven minutes for it. So you have that, then you flush it out to three and you flush it out to a minute and a half, then you flush it to 30 seconds, then you flush it to that advocacy statement. So whatever works in terms of how I would start big maybe and then go narrow or start with your why and then go big. And so then you have these different compartmentalized ways to talk about your story based on the context. If you're at a networking situation, nobody's going to want a seven minute story. You lost them after, you know, they want the one minute or less smile. Now get back to me. Right. And I remember Dale Carnegie saying he, he was surprised at how people loved him at this, at this function, because he did all the asking of questions and didn't talk about himself. People love to talk about themselves, but because there's so many sound bites and distractions, it's key to get that advocacy statement and narrow it in and build from there. And Kathleen has a good point, I'm sure. And, and Tina, isn't it kind of who the audience is? Like your absolutely your story should be tailored to your audience. Yes. And that is very crucial. So if your boss, if you're walking with your boss, you know, and you have a water cool cooler walk, that's a very different experience than if you have a boardroom and they say, okay, you have 30 minutes, tell us. You know, so it's speaking context. It's called the rhetorical situation. To whom are you speaking? Where are you speaking? Why are you speaking? So it's looking at that context of what are you trying to accomplish? Who's your audience? And what's the point of view? And Elvira, you had something? Oh, just, I mean, I have no context on what Jamie's saying, but given that she was saying she has multiple threads, I almost wonder if there's an opportunity to set up multiple stories on, you know, based on a different thread. And then absolutely you, you read whoever you're work, you know, talking to and just pull out the relevant story. 
Absolutely. Based on the audience. That's a great point. And it's looking at it, it. This is where I really recommend all of you get a storytelling journal. So you have more than one story. You have several. And it's depending on what you want to accomplish, whether it's you want to embed it in a workshop or you want to just, you know, give a spiel to a potential client or to a funder or whatever. So if you can get a book that is devoted to just listing out different childhood memory stories, business stories, and label them, you know, according to categories of this is me displaying courage or I worked through a failure or whatever that is. And, you know, but start with your origin story. If you have your own business, make sure you have that one tightly knit uh, and then work and branch to different ones. Well, it looks like we're at time. This was a great conversation. I appreciate all of you. Certainly check out tinabakehouse.com as well as I know Kathleen, she has her uh, website as well. And we're both on LinkedIn. We'd love to connect with you. And I'm happy, you know, if you want more information, I do individual and group coaching for public speaking and storytelling and do workshops. We do have another workshop coming up February 24th, 1130 Central Standard Time, which is, you know, communicate and lead with power. Know yourself, your team, and your client. We'd love to have you join. So you can email me at tinab at tinabakehouse.com. Happy to give you that link. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day.